Hi, I'm Jane, and I'm here to ask Google my Bible questions. Okay, Google, what does the Bible say about creation? Sorry, connecting to internet. Try again later. Okay, next question, Google. So who's Jesus? Try it again. Jesus is a fictional character. Jesus is not a fictional character. He's not. Okay, Google, let's try you again. This is the third or fourth time. I hope you're doing better. What does the Bible say about praying and prayer? Praying is asking God for things we want. Well, that's kind of a crummy answer. I don't like Google. Mm -mm. Okay, Google, did God create the world? The world evolved over millions of years. Oh, gee, I'm not listening anymore. I'm gonna give you one more chance. One more question. Okay, Google, tell me, how do I get to heaven? Sorry, I don't have any information about that. No, I'm done, I'm out. I'm gonna go see home. What'd you think about that? I believe uh, Jane will be in our Christmas pageant and any other acting uh, options that we have. Very nice, very nice, very cute. Uh, so thank you very much for that. Uh, and we will try to do better than Google um, or whatever, whatever you're using. I actually uh, find Google very helpful, but you have to filter it. You have to kind of know what sources that you're willing to trust, right? Uh, also, be in prayer for some of our staff. No one is really sick, but if we have a few that are sick, including Pastor Paul, and so uh, keep them in prayer uh, as they are getting through minor illnesses. Um, so we are gonna do our very best to answer your Bible questions. And I know that as you go through the Word of God in your own Bible reading, or perhaps you're listening to a sermon, you're going to come up with a question. And this is the time of the year. We take two or three weeks to break our, whatever the study is that we're doing at the time, and we will attempt to answer your Bible questions with the Bible. And I love having this as a resource uh, because as we go through this, we're finding all the answers to life and to eternity. Isn't that a wonderful thing? to have all the answers in a book that you can easily, easily grab and read. And I hope you do. On our trip to Israel, our guide is a very knowledgeable man, and he complimented our group because of the Bible knowledge that they had. And that's really good. That means that you all are learning. It means that we're all wanting to know more and more about this, this book. Another interesting thing about the Bible is that it's, uh, you're not able to exhaust it. In other words, it's like the ocean. It's, it's got a, a shallow beach where a little child can enjoy it and understand it, but it has depths that we have yet to explore. And so think about this book in that way. And don't say, well, I can't understand it. No, you can understand it if you'll just read it and start to study it and compare scripture with scripture. And don't take any verse out of context. Con out of context. Don't use scripture to interpret scripture. And when you do that, you're gonna find the answers. And the answers usually lie within the context. What we'll do today is uh, answer the questions that were asked that pertain to end times prophecy. There's usually a lot of those. And so I put them all into one, and most of our questions today will pertain to end times prophecy. The first question that we'll try to answer today is, someone asked this, please explain the abomination of desolation. And so what I did was I Googled it. I, I really did. And one of the first answers that came up was from Wikipedia. And Wikipedia says, Mark gives Jesus a speech. It wasn't Mark recorded Jesus' speech. Mark gives Jesus a speech. So red flags coming up right there. Concerning the second coming with Matthew adding a reference to 
Daniel. And then Wikipedia goes on and says, chapters one through six of the book of Daniel originated as a collection of folk tales among the Jewish community in the late fourth and early third centuries BCE. Now we've been going through Daniel verse by verse and we will resume that next year. And we've already discovered that Daniel is, uh, is not a collection of Jewish folk tales, but is a, a collection of profound uh, prophecies uh, about the future. And so what is it? Is it, uh, as the, the great sage and oracle Wikipedia says, an abomination of desolation is a fictional story about a fictional story? Or is, is it something more, something more to this? Well, we do read about it in Matthew 24. And this is when Jesus is speaking in the, the latter part of his ministry, and he's on the Mount of Olives overlooking the temple of Jerusalem. We were just there many times. It's one of my favorite places to be because the Mount of Olives, if you're not on the very top, if you're on the slope, it's a very peaceful place, a very beautiful place. In the hustle and bustle of Jerusalem, it is a place that I, I would enjoy to go for its peace. And you know, I'm sure that's why Jesus went there. He went to the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, to Gethsemane which means olive press, the, the night in which he's betrayed. He went to the Mount of Olives to teach his disciples a number of times. And there, he says in Matthew 24, 15, when ye therefore shall see the, here it is, abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. So we're talking about the temple that they were looking down upon, the holy place, the part of the temple, the abomination of desolation, uh, then it says, whosoever readeth, let him understand. Let him which be in Judah flee into the mountains. So Jesus looked at this as a future event. Now we do know that uh, Wikipedia says that they're referring to something that happened in, before Jesus' day, Antiochus Epiphanes, a Greek ruler. But the Bible is clear that this is not about a fictional story. As a matter of fact, those people that are cited in the Wikipedia article are contradicting the scriptures. And the Bible is very clear about at the end of the day, every knee will bow at the name of Jesus. Of things in heaven and of things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And all the people that were critical of the scriptures and said that it's, it's uh, Mark adding a speech to Jesus or Daniel's collection of folktales, they will also bow to Jesus. Now, for them it'll be probably too late because today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of, of understanding that Jesus is the Christ, the, the promised one, and put your trust in him because tomorrow may be too late. But let's talk about this. How do we know that the abomination of desolation is still future? How do we know that it wasn't fulfilled before Jesus by the Greek ruler in 167 BC, Antiochus Epiphanes? Uh, Epiphanes is the name he gave himself, which means manifest God. Uh, and he was, of course, not. He, he considered himself as God, but of course he was not. And he's also called Antiochus IV. His forces went into Jerusalem and they went into the Jewish temple. They set up an altar of Zeus and they offered pigs as a sacrifice there in the temple. Now certainly that is an abomination of desolation. But I don't think it's the abomination of desolation. So we're going to try to pick through that real quick and, and make sure we understand it. By the way, tonight at sundown is the beginning of Hanukkah. Hanukkah means dedication. It's the feast of dedication. It's the, the eight-day feast which commemorates the cleansing of what Antiochus Epiphanes did by the Jewish heroes, the Maccabees. And this was all, of course, before Jesus, but they came and they defeated the Greeks, and they cleansed the temple, and they had enough oil for one 
night in the menorah, and it burned for eight. And Jesus referenced this as well and observed this feast of dedication, Hanukkah. So as we begin through this with our Jewish friends, let us think about that and the significance that Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And that light will never, ever go out. It'll last more than eight days, amen? So, again, Jesus spoke about the desecration, the abomination, as being future. Abomination is an obscenity. It's profound evil. It's a thing that causes great disgust. And it's so bad that it makes the temple unusable. It desecrates it. So there's this act that Jesus says is still future that will be a disgusting, obscene act by an obscene person, very similar to or maybe exactly like Antiochus Epiphanes. Antiochus Epiphanes certainly was a foreshadowing of this man of sin that is in the future. And some people say, well, it, it, maybe it's Titus because Jesus also predicted that all the buildings of the temple and all of Jerusalem would be destroyed. And certainly that did happen in 70 AD by the Romans, by the general Titus who later became the, the emperor himself. But did Titus desecrate the temple? If you'll study that, and I've been curious because some people that hold a different view of end times, events, eschatology, they're called preterists, they say that Titus did cause the abomination of desolation. And that would be, of course, after Jesus. So could that be it? If you'll study what he did, Titus wanted to desecrate the temple. Titus wanted to set up an altar to a pagan god and ordered his men to not destroy the temple. You would think if a Roman general ordered his men not to do something, they wouldn't do it. But you know what happened? They were so enraged, they were so bloodthirsty that they disobeyed the order and they literally burnt down the temple and destroyed it against the order of Titus. Now some people say, well, the very fact that they burned it, they desecrated it. I don't think so. I don't think so. There's an act, there's an abomination that has to happen in the holy place that Jesus mentioned. So I don't think that was it. Which also means that it's still in the future. Because we haven't seen anything like that. The temple was destroyed, there's no temple now. You say, well then that, that leads to another question, right? Uh, the temple, if it's not there and it needs to be desecrated in the future, when is that gonna happen? Well, we're gonna get to that in the next question, so stay tuned. But. Let's go back and let's read what Daniel said. He actually mentions the abomination of desolation three times in his writing. First in Daniel 9, and he, and this is, I believe, the Antichrist, shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. We interpret that as a week of years, so seven years, a seven-year peace treaty. The Antichrist will confirm this. He will finally achieve what no one has been able to achieve. Many have come close to it. Every president in my lifetime, I know they've worked hard to achieve Middle East peace, even Donald Trump. But none of them succeeded. Now, Trump did achieve peace with some of the moderate Muslim neighbors of Israel in the Abraham Accords, and that is incredible, incredible that they accomplished that. But that's still not peace with Israel, and mainly the Palestinians is, is the big issue. So this Antichrist will confirm the covenant with many for one week. So we have to couple this desecration with a leader that will uh, finally achieve Middle Eastern peace. At least he will seem to have achieved peace. They will sign a seven-year pact. In the midst of the week, so if we're talking about seven years, then this is three and a half years, he, the Antichrist, shall cause the sacrifice. So if there's a temple... There's sacrifices, if there's sacrifices, there's a temple. I was just there, there's no temple. But I have some exciting news to tell you about in a minute, if the Lord tarries. Now if the rapture happens before I get to that, I'm fine with that too. The sacrifice and the oblation will cease, so they will have resumed temple worship and sacrifice, and he will stop that, just like Antichus Epiphanes did, for the overspreading of abominations, 
he shall make it desolate. There it is. There it is, the abomination of desolation. Even until the consummation, I believe this is the end, which is the second coming of Christ, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate uh, for the last three and a half years. God's wrath, the consummation, will be poured upon the Antichrist as he has taken up seat in the Jewish temple, proclaiming himself to be God and probably sacrificing a pig. I don't know exactly what he's going to do, but whatever it is, it's going to be obscene, it's going to be of great evil, it's going to be disgusting, and it will make the temple unusable for Jewish people. So that's what Daniel predicts in Daniel 9. Jesus calls this future. Titus didn't do that. And so I believe, and and by the way, there would be three and a half years, according to Daniel 9, that the Antichrist will continue to desecrate the temple. In Titus' day, it was over quickly, right? It wasn't there uh, desolating uh, for three and a half years. And then also in Daniel 11.31, I do believe this is referring to Antiochus Epiphanes, but also foreshadowing the future Antichrist. It would say it's a double fulfillment. There's a, a pre and, and then a, an actual fulfillment of the prophecy. And arms shall on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and shall, make, and shall place the abomination that make it desolate. So if you look at Daniel 11, it does talk about, very detailed about Antiochus Epiphanes. Again, that's in the future. Daniel didn't live during the time of the Greek Empire. That would be future. That's profound. But again, I believe it's a foreshadowing of the future desecration by the Antichrist. And then the last place we read about in Daniel 12, in verse 11, and from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away. So we, we continue to see that there was a sacrifice happening and that that's going to stop. And the abomination that make it desolate set up So it's not only a man, it's something that he sets up, it's something that he does, uh, shall be, and now we're given a time, 1,290 days. So 1,290 days, if you do the math, is almost exactly three and a half years, okay? So here we have Daniel talking about it. In Revelation, the Bible is clear. There will be a future global dictator that will confirm a seven-year peace treaty with Israel and her neighbors and will follow the pattern of Antiochus IV, desecrating the tribulation temple halfway through the tribulation. And on our Daniel prophecy chart, that will be right here. This is the tribulation. It's seven years, three and a half years, three and a half years. The Antichrist will be uh, part of that. It'll start actually with the signing of the peace treaty, uh, which I believe the rapture happens right before that. We're going to talk about the rapture today as well. Halfway through, the temple has to have been built somewhere in this first three and a half years, or even before. We don't know exactly when. But it'll have to be at least uh, up in time for him to desecrate it in the halfway point of the tribulation. And then God's wrath pours upon the earth. Jesus comes back with his saints at the end of the seven years and sets up a millennial kingdom. So that is an answer. Uh, Explain the desecration of the temple and I believe it's future, modeled after Antiochus Epiphanes in the time of the Greeks. Next question. We know that part of the Antichrist seven-year peace deal with Israel will include the Jews being able to rebuild the third temple on the Temple Mount. Now let me just stop right there and and say this. We don't know that. We don't know that the seven-year peace treaty, a piece of that will be the rebuilding of the temple. I think so. The Bible doesn't say that. It just says there will be a temple halfway through the tribulation. That's all we know. We don't know if it's part of the peace deal or what, but I think it has to. I mean, if it's not there today and the rapture is soon and the tribulation is soon, which I think, I think we're, heading, we're heading there. I think, I think it's not that far off. I've always felt that. And I know that when I was you know, five, I, I thought it could happen any moment. I actually asked my dad. I said, And this is a profound theological question. Don't laugh at a five-year-old's profound theological questions. I said, Dad, how will we get through the cloudies? And then he just laughed and laughed and laughed. I thought it was a great question. And then he would always, he was always bring that up. So I, I, you know, right? Isn't that a good, isn't that a really good question from a five-year-old? So anyways, but but I know for sure uh, it's 45 years closer than then. 
Okay? So that's the bottom line is the, Jesus is coming back. And by the way, there's lots of views on end times, and, and we have our view, and I, be, I believe it's a very biblical view of our ministry. It will not change. I'm, I'm that convinced about our view of eschatology. But uh, the end, the, at the end of the day, I hope that if you call yourself a believer in Jesus Christ, I hope that you believe that he is coming back. Because that's the important thing. We don't have to argue about when, all these details. But I, I, I think we should study them. I just don't think they should be matters of contention. But certainly we should study them and, and know what the Bible has to say. And then the, the question continues, how will the Antichrist be able to broker such a deal with the Arabs who would be totally opposed to such an idea? And, and they would, okay? So we're talking about the Muslims. They, although Israel in 1967 took control of the Temple Mount, which is incredible. You know, in 1947, they weren't a nation. But the Bible said they would be scattered and he would bring them back. And that happened in our lifetimes. In the lifetime of your parents or grandparents, that happened. One of the greatest modern miracles of all times is that not only were they brought back, but that they survived. Every time I'm there, I, I'm again amazed that how, how did they win against all odds, against all their enemies from all sides that wanted to drive them into the sea? Somehow, some way, they survived. There is a God. And the Bible is true, okay? I know that for sure. But even though the Jews, Israel controls the Temple Mount, technically, the next day they gave it back in 1967 to the Muslim authority, the Waf. It, it, it astounds me that they did that. And I believe the reason that that happened because it wasn't God's time yet. So what, what, is, what is sitting there today where the Jewish temple once stood? Well, there's a shrine. It's technically not a mosque. There is a mosque, but it's, not, it's off to the side. The mosque is a silver or dark colored dome. That's the Al-Aqsa Mosque. That's very important to Muslims, and I think that will not be moved, okay, in the, in the future uh, rebuilding of the temple. I believe that will stay. But what is in the way is something called the Dome of the Rock, and it's a beautiful building. When you're looking at Jerusalem, you see it from all vantage points, and it actually has gold leaf that was added uh, not that long ago, and it's a very beautiful, shining uh, golden dome right there in the middle, right where the temple would stand. So, so what's going to happen with that? Well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But here's a verse that I keep thinking of. If the abomination of desolation is in the future, that means that the temple will have to be rebuilt and sacrifices resumed by at least the midpoint of the tribulation. The Bible in Revelation 11, talking about, I, I believe, the tribulation temple, the third temple, there's been two so far, okay, Solomon built the first temple. His father David prepared everything for Solomon to build it. He purchased the floor. He brought in builders. He had the plans. He gathered the materials, but he couldn't build it, so uh, Solomon built it. And it was beautiful. It was glorious. And then it was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. And then they came back after 70 years of captivity and Zerubbabel rebuilt a temple. And it was nothing as glorious as Solomon's temple. And people that had seen Solomon's temple wept when they saw Zerubbabel's temple. But they had a temple. And there it was in the days of Nehemiah as he accomplished a security wall around Jerusalem. Uh, there was now a temple. That's the second temple. And then later on in history in the time of Herod the Great, you remember the one that had the slaughter of the innocents in Bethlehem. This is in the time of Jesus' birth. Herod the Great made Zerubbabel's temple. He left the temple, but he, around it, made a grand edifice that uh, everybody, everybody said it was the wonder of the world. And then that temple was destroyed, as Jesus predicted, in 70 AD by Titus. And there's no temple now, but there will be a temple, as the Bible predicts, as Daniel and Revelation predict, in the tribulation, I'll call it the tribulation temple or the third temple. 
Revelation 11.1 1 says, and there was given me a reed, so this is John the Apostle, as he's talking about the future events that are coming, he's given a reed uh, like unto a rod, so this is considered a measuring stick, and the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship thereon. So now we have in the tribulation a temple, but the court which is without the temple, leave out. Now what, what in the world? Measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. And the holy city shall they tread underfoot 42 months, three and a half years. Okay, so what is, what is this court of the Gentiles leave out? I, I, I see it as the Al-Aqsa Mosque, if it's anytime soon. So somehow, in some sort of negotiation, and I just spoke to some rabbis in Israel, they're very excited because there's a man in Texas, I was just with this man, who has been trying to find the Jewish people a red heifer. The red heifer is a ceremony before you can build a temple, before you can have sacrifices, the red heifer has to be perfect. It can't have any marks, so they can't, you know, they always put the tags through the ears of the cows. It has to be of a certain age, and it can never have done any work. It has to be killed in a certain place on the Mount of Olives by a certain group of people, and they have to have these other elements to it. And I spoke to the people that are working on that, and they have found two red heifers in Texas. And they're, they're going to they're gonna fly them over to Israel. And they're asking us to cover it within grace. I don't know if we will, because they believe the red heifer ceremony will bring the redemption of Israel. And I will say this clearly to them and to everyone else, that the redemption of Israel doesn't have to do with the resumption of the temple worship or the red heifer. It has to do with them believing in Yeshua, the Messiah who has come. They missed that, but there's only one way of salvation for an individual or for a nation, and that is put their trust in the Messiah, the Messiah that has come, and he's coming again. But it's still interesting that there's a passion, there's a yearning, like we've never seen before, to sacrifice the red heifer, that uh, cow would, he, would be burned and the ashes put into water, and that water would be able to purify the entire nation. Each individual would have to be purified. And then the temple rebuilt and then the sacrifice was resumed. There's a huge push to at least pray on the Temple Mount. Right now a Jewish person is not legally allowed to go up and pray on the Temple Mount. But there's a massive push, uh, and I felt it again while I was there, to resume that. At the very least to pray on the Temple Mount and many, many want to actually rebuild the temple and continue the sacrifices. So, Revelation 11.2 tells us the court of the temple will be not uh, included because it'll be given unto the Gentiles and they will uh, trod it underfoot. Unfortunately, on this trip, somebody was shot in the old city the day that we were supposed to go up onto the Temple Mount and uh, we were not able to go up there. But we've been up there many times and it's an intriguing place thinking about the history, thinking about the present situation, and thinking about the future. And I can just envision it. So how, how could this happen? Well, part of the negotiation with peace would be, I believe, that th there, there would be things offered to the Palestinians, and in exchange, they would allow um, the, the, the removal of the Dome of the Rock and rebuilt somewhere else. Where, I'm not sure, this is not my idea, by the way. This is what the rabbi just told me. This is what he thinks may, they may be willing to, to do. And if he's going to tell me that, I'm guessing that he must have inside information on this. To me, it would be hard to imagine that, that the Muslims would agree to, to take down the Dome of the Rock and move it somewhere else, but that's what he just told me a few days ago. So, um, is the temple part of the negotiation for a peace? Probably but we don't know for sure. But I know for sure, during the tribulation, there will be a third temple. And there actually will be a, a fourth temple. 
as well. So where will this be? Again, it'll be right here in the tribulation, at least by this point. Does, does that mean that if we see, let's say we see the, the temple being built here, this is in our church age, let's say sometime before the rapture, we don't know when it'll be built, but we know the seven-year peace treaty starts the tribulation, and I'm guessing that that will be part of the negotiation. They'll get permission, that'll be a bargaining piece, it'll be constructed quickly right in this area, and operational uh, for some time before the halfway point of the tribulation. Next question. There seems to be a lot of debate with pre-trib and mid to post-trib rapture. Now, some of you have no idea what I'm talking about, so let me just stop for a second and explain the different positions. Uh, There are some Christians that believe that Jesus will take out the believers before the tribulation. That's called pre-tribulation rapture. That's what I believe. That's what this church believes. That's what we have historically believed, and I'm more convinced today than I ever was. Some people believe that we will be raptured at the midpoint of the tribulation, or they call it pre-wrath rapture, and there's another group that believes that we will be raptured at the end of the tribulation and come right back with the Lord in the second coming. I'm not going to go into the other two views in detail other than tell you, well, let me finish the question and then tell you what I'm going to say. This question, this person says, I have heard that the meaning of the saints being taken up or rapture isn't in the original Dead Sea Scrolls. Is this true or can you clarify? Let me answer that real quick and then I'll go to the different positions on the tribulation. The Dead Sea Scrolls are primarily uh, copies of the Old Testament, of the Hebrew Scriptures. The rapture isn't mentioned in the Hebrew scriptures. The church is a mystery in the Old Testament, so therefore not finding them in the Dead Sea Scrolls would be logical. We wouldn't find the rapture there because it isn't talked about in the Old Testament. So I don't know where this person heard that. I I don't know where that would have come from, but um, to me, yeah, the, 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 the Dead Sea Scrolls are an amazing find, and again, they line up with the rebirth of Israel almost this, almost to the day that Israel was reborn. So, did uh, we have a great reaffirmation that God has preserved his word. And it says, <clears throat> the, the, uh, it, let's look at the prophecy chart real quick and understand, some people think, as we do, that the rapture is going to happen right here, and that is before the tribulation. Some people say it's going to happen in the midpoint, and some people say it's going to be right here at the end. So this is the view that we hold, and why is that? Well, I think it's pretty simple. Let me first give you the verses that talk about this rapture, and there's other places, but these are the main ones. Jesus said in the very last day before he went to the cross, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. I believe that's the rapture. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. These are not those of you that are asleep in church. I'm looking around to see if we have any. By the way, you can kind of act like you're faking it by kind of holding your your chin up with your elbow, but man, there's no faking that you're asleep in church. Uh, These are people that have died in the faith. That ye sorrow not even as others that have no hope. So a Christian funeral is a lot different than a funeral of a lost person because we have hope. We have a confident expectation of seeing that person again because of their faith in Jesus Christ and our faith in Jesus Christ. But for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, how can I be saved from my sins? How can I be raptured? If you believe that Jesus died and rose again for you, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Those that have died in the faith in the church age and those that are alive, we will be caught up For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them or go ahead of them which are asleep. In other words, uh, the dead in Christ will rise first and then we, as it says here, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Why? Because they have six feet further to come. True. True. Then we, which are alive and remain, and I hope that means me, because it'll be a glorious thing to not have to face physical death 
I'm not afraid of death, but I'm not looking forward to dying. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up. Okay, here's the word, harpizo in Greek, and it's the uh, rapturo in Latin. It's this idea of being caught up or snatched or taken away together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Don't confuse this with the second coming. Second coming, Jesus comes to the earth, the saints with him on the Mount of Olives where he went up. This is before that, he's coming to, to gather the church, the bride, and take her up in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord, wherefore comfort one another with these words. Isn't that comforting? To think that this could happen in our lifetime? Uh, I want you to read later 1 Corinthians 15, 51, which is another great passage that gives you detail on this. But let me just tell you a couple things. Uh, the church and Israel are two distinct entities in Scripture. We are not Israel, Israel's not the church. There's a, a horrible doctrine called replacement theology that the church has replaced Israel. They failed, and so we're gonna, we're gonna do what they failed to do. And certainly I will say they failed to recognize as a nation Jesus as the Messiah, but that doesn't mean that God is done with them. How do I know? Because in Romans 11, 12, and 13, it says that. God gave Israel a promise forever, and it was an unconditional promise that they would have the land forever. And I believe that will be fulfilled literally for a distinct entity called Israel. So the church is not Israel, Israel's not the church, and the church has to be taken up before God can work again with Israel to continue the stop clock of Daniel's prophecies of 70 weeks. There's one more week left. In the, there's 69 that have been fulfilled from the rebuilding of, of the walls of Jerusalem until the coming of the, of the prince. Uh, 69 weeks, 483 years, have been fulfilled. There's seven years left to fulfill the arc of the 470 years, the 70 weeks of Daniel. And that is the tribulation. And we will be caught up so God can work again with just Israel. Just Israel. The stop clock the uh, stop watch stopped when Jesus came into Jerusalem and he was rejected. Now there's this mystery, the church age. We are the church. We're not Jew or Gentile. We're all one in Christ, right? But once that church is taken out, now God can deal directly with Israel again for that last week of Daniel's prophecy. Also, the Bible speaks of during the tribulation, all restraint will be removed and evil will have its way. Today, just the fact that there are Christians that are indwelt by the Spirit of God, that's the temple, by the way. We are the temple of the Holy Ghost. We don't need a temple today to worship. We worship in spirit and in truth, right? But there is a day when the Holy Spirit will be taken with the believers and the earth no longer will have that restrainer. And you think the world is bad today? Just wait until the Holy Spirit's restraining influence is gone and all evil will break loose. And then also there's a doctrine called imminency. It's this idea of watching and waiting for the return of the Lord. The only view that keeps Israel separate from the church, the only view that removes the restraint during the seven year tribulation, the only view that keeps intact the doctrine of expectancy is pre-tribulational rapture. Because we would know exactly when Jesus would return if it was in the middle of the tribulation. We would know exactly when Jesus would return if it's at the end of the tribulation. The only one that we wouldn't know exactly when he'll return is before the tribulation. So that's why we hold to that view, and I believe it's a, a scriptural view. I'm not gonna argue with people. You're welcome to stay here. You know, and as we go up, I'll just look at you and, you know, smile. That's, that's all. That's all. And, and I, also, I also love the idea that it's the only view that, uh, that uh, makes sure that we, in First Thessalonians 5, 9, uh, we understand that God hath not appointed us to wrath. And, and some people say, well, the second half of the tribulation is God's wrath. Have you read the first half of the tribulation? It's not so great, okay? So uh, I, I believe that God has not appointed us to wrath but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ.
Next question, how much time will there be from the Battle of Armageddon to the start of the Millennial Kingdom? Okay, so the next event after the Battle of Armageddon, which would happen right here, the second coming of Christ, Battle of Armageddon, it's a series of conflicts that take place uh, in Jerusalem, in something called the Valley of Jehoshaphat, which is the Kidron Valley, in the Jezreel Valley, which is in Megiddo. Um, from that until, and that's the second coming of Christ, until the millennium, which is a thousand years of Israel regathered, reunited, and restored, and Christ reigning from the throne of David, we will rule and reign with him as a distinct entity from Israel, but we will rule and reign with him. Uh, so between the millennium, thousand, a literal thousand years, and the, uh, the Battle of Armageddon, which is right here, how much time elapses. We really don't know. It could be just immediate, as soon as all the enemies of God are vanquished, so then starts a thousand years. Or maybe there's a cleanup period. Certainly there's going to be a lot of cleaning up to do. In Ezekiel, it talks about a battle of Gog and Magog, when I believe this is something that will precipitate the rapture or the, the peace treaty of Israel when the enemies of Israel come against Israel and God saves them, the Antichrist will probably take the credit. The Bible talks about seven years it'll take to clean up and burn those weapons and bury those bodies. How much more, how much longer will it take to clean up after the seven-year tribulation, after the battle of Armageddon? We don't know. So I, I really don't have an answer for you other than um, it's probably going to be some weeks or some months before the actual millennium starts where Jesus sits on the throne of David. Uh, but I do know this, that I'm looking forward to the millennium as much as I am to the rapture. And let me give you a couple verses that relate to the millennium. Uh, we know there is such a thing because Revelation 20 verse 4, it talks about this, uh, the, the, the souls that were beheaded during the tribulation uh, for the witness of Jesus and they will, they, they didn't worship the beast, which is the Antichrist. They didn't have the mark of the beast on them, but they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So we have this thousand year reign of Christ. We also know, and Micah it tells us, that um, there will be all these blessings that will happen. The, the city of Jerusalem, I believe, will be lifted up above the hills. Uh, we know that when Jesus comes, the Mount of Olives is going to split water from the fourth temple, the millennial temple, and you can read about that in, in Ezekiel, uh, water flows out through the Mount of Olives down to the Dead Sea and brings the Dead Sea to life. It's going to be an incredible time in history. Nations are going to come up to worship the Lord in the fourth temple, the millennial temple, and uh, he will judge among many people and rebuke strong nations afar off. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares. Won't that be a wonderful day when we won't need weapons? We won't need a military. It's going to be glorious. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And I like this the best. Then shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree. In other words, there's going to be a time when nobody is afraid. It's going to be a time of peace and prosperity like we've all yearned for. And finally, it will be achieved, but only when the Prince of Peace comes. All of our attempts to achieve peace have failed, but there is one coming that will succeed in bringing peace to the world. Isaiah 35 talks about the lame uh, running like a deer, the, the tongue of the, the dumb are, are speaking and singing, and the wilderness will break forth uh, water in the desert. All of these incredible prophecies, and we can go on and on and on, Isaiah 11 talks about the, the, we say the lion and the lamb, but it's the wolf will dwell with the lamb. If you put a wolf and a lamb together in a cage today, what will happen? Use your imagination. Um, a, a calf and a young lion in the same cage, what will happen? A child leading these ferocious beasts, what will happen? Well, there's going to be a day when all of that will stop cancer, pain, sickness, death, uh, uh, violence, and it'll be a thousand years of peace and prosperity. And then there will be a final rebellion and then a future just like the millennium will continue forever and ever. So I, I'm looking forward to that millennium. 
I don't know exactly how long after the tribulation, but my guess is there will be some sort of time gap. What will we be speaking during the millennium? These are curious questions. I have a feeling there's one person asking most of these. Okay, you know who you are, but it's fine, it's fine. Okay, so what language, will we all be speaking one language in the millennium? I think yes. I, I, th- I think we're gonna have a restoration of the way it was intended to be. God did not intend all of us to speak different languages. When I'm abroad, we went through Turkey, uh, we went through Germany, we were in Israel. I know like a couple words in a couple languages, and I'm so lost in, in, in these other countries. Thank goodness for Google Translate. I, I can avoid parking tickets by taking a picture of the parking signs that, that are in Hebrew. I have no idea what they say. So I t- snap a picture, and it get, but it's very cumbersome, right? Languages have divided us, and that's what God wanted. God wanted us to spread out upon the whole earth and not build a one big city and, and as they did in Babel. So God confused the languages, and I believe Zechariah 3, 9 suggests, we don't know for sure, look at it, that there will be a resumption of one language. What will that language be? I'd say Hebrew. I truly do, but I don't know. It certainly won't be English, amen? Yeah. So it talks about returning people to a pure language in Zephaniah 3, 9, so that's my opinion on that. Uh, This question, we know that the main reason we use the King James Bible is because it is based on the received text and not the critical text like modern Bibles. Just a real quick side note, uh, we use an old version of the English Bible. Why do we do it? Because it comes from the received text, which is a really pure, uh, uh, an excellent uh, uh, family of manuscripts. We don't have any of the originals, but we, we use the received text and it gives us great confidence that what we're reading in our English Bible is what God originally intended, and most modern Bibles are, uh, co- are translated from critical texts that use, I believe, corrupted manuscripts. So, that's a whole other series and sermon, we're not going to get into that. But the person says, we also know every language does not have a received text Bible, which is true. Will every language have a received text Bible during the millennium? So, I, I don't think we're going to need that anymore. We're going to have the Word, right? We're going to have Jesus, and so uh, I don't really have an answer for this question other than I don't, I don't think it applies anymore uh, because of all of that. Okay, in, re- in reading what the Bible says about the end times, I don't see America mentioned at all. How exactly does America fall from being a major world power, as we see today, to not being mentioned at all during the end times? So this is a very good question. Where is America in end times prophecy? You can't find it clearly. Certainly, I believe that America, although not explicitly mentioned, certainly will be part of end times. Maybe we will have fallen. Certainly, that could happen. An enemy could take us out. That could happen. You say, no, that can never happen. Oh, it could happen. When we're spending so much money, we can have a a massive internal collapse, We are promoting things that are opposed to God. We are teaching them now to our preschoolers, okay? So we could have a huge implosion. Uh, We've already had one morally, but following that, as Rome experienced, will be an implosion of their society and of their nation. Uh, Certainly, we could also have been absorbed into a region. There are a lot of people that say we shouldn't have borders, you know, and that would solve the immigrant, immigrant crisis, right? Not really. Uh, you'll, you'll just have more problems, but either way, uh, people want to do away with borders, so maybe we'd be a, uh, a government of North America, okay? Certainly, that would fit into the end time scenario of one leader that would be in charge of different regions of the world. Um, I also see that we have, in Revelation 18.3, it says, all nations have drunk the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Who is her? This is Babylon. I believe that America has corrupted the world as much as we have blessed the world with our music, with our culture, with our movies, and all of the things that we've put out there. Uh, We are the main influencer of the world in unfortunately, uh, mostly evil ways these days. And so I believe that we're gonna be under the wrath of God in in regards to being at least the financial Babylon in Revelation 18.3. Certainly, I don't think we'll be a superpower at that time. Uh, We will have uh, given up our 
our power to a more central world, world government, or maybe we won't exist anymore, I don't know. But certainly you would think that we would be mentioned more if, uh, if we were part of end times prophecy, and I, I don't see that in scripture. Okay, another question is the souls that go to heaven before the rapture, are they tangible? So I, the, the questioner is asking, so when, when someone dies that's saved today, uh, or even if they're not saved, their body go, stays, but their spirit and soul departs. We know that for sure. Okay, so what, what is the state of that spirit and soul? What are they like before their flesh is reunited? So we know at the rapture, the Lord will take our body wherever it will be, whatever decomposition it will be, or it's cremated or whatever, it will bring back those molecules in a perfect remade body and reunite it with the soul. But what happens in the meantime? If you were to, to die and go to heaven, your body's still here, and you bump into someone that's already died and gone to heaven, will you recognize them? Well, they have a face. You know, what is the answer to that? How would you recognize a soul without their flesh? Excellent question, and here is the best answer that I have. When Moses and Elijah met with Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration, they were represented as having bodies, right? Look at Matthew 17, 2. Jesus was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah, Elias, talking with him. So they would not have had their physical bodies yet, their glorified bodies, but they must have some sort of intermediate, temporary body that has likeness characteristics that we have today. So that's the best answer I can give you. Great question. And here's our final question. How do people get saved without knowing Jesus? And the example would be American Indians. I would just say this. There is no salvation apart from Jesus Christ. So the question then is, people that are uh, uh, far away from any gospel message, so you would think about in the jungles or wherever, and they've never heard a missionary, they've never had a Bible, how can they be saved? That should motivate us, shouldn't it? To get out there and to share the message of the gospel? But I know this, God is fair, God is, is right. Okay, I know that all people have the same amount of light, look at Romans 1.19, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. In our very conscience, in our very being, we know that there is a God. How do I know that? Because every atheist that's about to die cries out to God. We know deep down there is a God. We have to push that away. We have to not deny that. So if we know by our conscience that there is a God, it says, God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. In other words, when we see the world, we know that it was made. We have to make up stories that we came from nothing, that we evolved from animals. That's not true. That's not in the Bible. Science actually doesn't teach that. They say it's scientific when they teach evolution, but it's not. It's a, it's a faith. It's just as much of a religion as we have. They weren't there. They don't know. All they're looking at is the same evidence that we have. But the invisible things, so if I held up a, well, let's just say I hold up this pen. This is a, a high-tech pen. It, and with this pen, I can <clears throat> write on the screen. I can click, and the slide changes, okay? This is a high-tech pen. Do any of you believe that this came about by accident? Nobody does, right? Because everyone sees design and its shape and its function and it has buttons, it has to be charged. It can, I mean, there's a lot of technology involved. It, it, there's probably hundreds and hundreds of people that have worked on this technology. So would we be f fools to say this just came about by chance or should we credit those that made this and say, no, it took a lot of brain power and, and time and work and effort to, to gather all of the elements to, to create this incredible device, this little magic pen. But then we say something far more complicated, the one cell in the human body is far more complicated than this, and we say that just came about by chance. So in other words, every person in the world, no matter where they are, has the same evidence that there is a God, okay? And they are without excuse. You say, wait a second, 
How can they be saved if they've never heard the name of Jesus? Here's what I think. Since God is fair, if someone is seeking for truth, God will give them truth. How is that? I know there are stories of people that have been in, in, in remote places that have seen truth and know there's truth and, and are yearning for truth and they call out to God and God brings them a missionary. There's many stories of this. People, they arrive, the missionaries arrive at a village and they say, we've been praying for you to come for the last three years. So I know for sure that only one name will save you and that is the name of Jesus. He is the son of God. He came to live the life that you couldn't live. He died for your sins on a cross and he rose again the third day. And he says, if you will believe in me, trust in me, you will be saved today, tomorrow, and forever. You don't have to fear the coming judgments that are predicted in this incredible book that will be falling upon the earth. You don't have to fear that, for you will be saved from that wrath to come. You will be saved from the wrath of an eternal hell. Be saved to heaven to be with the Lord in a real, tangible, just like today, but without all of the problems that we have. It'll be a glorious future, but you first, first have to receive Jesus, Jesus by faith. Trust in him and him alone. And the Bible says when you do that, you will be saved. And that's the message we need to bring to the lost, to those people that are in remote places. We have to get out there. We want to pray for our young people to be called of God to take the message of the gospel to remote places. we got to use all media and technology to bring the gospel to a lost and dying world. So let's recommit to doing that as a church and as a people. Let me end by giving you the gospel, and that is a real simple message. And Jesus says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. Some people think God is out to get you. God just doesn't want you to have any fun. No, God loves you. He wants to be the perfect dad. You might not have had a perfect dad. You might not be a perfect dad. But God is the dad you want to be. God is the dad that you wish you had. He loves the world. He loves you so much that he came and he gave his only begotten son, that is Jesus, and whosoever believeth in him. What does that mean? That means to trust in him. Not a religion, not good works, not prayers, but to believe in him, trust in him, should not perish, which is hell, but have everlasting life. How can I be saved from hell? How can I be saved to heaven? It says it right there. Whosoever believeth in him, in Jesus, will be saved. And then on these verses, on this side, it says in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace are you saved through what? Faith, same word as believe, one's a verb, one's a noun, and that not of yourselves, it's a gift, gift of God. All you have to do is receive a gift called salvation, called eternal life, not of works. You can come to church every service that we ever have, and that will not save you. Salvation is not by what we do, it's by what Jesus did and our trusting in him. Not of works, lest any man should boast. No one will stand in heaven, myself included, and say, I deserve to be here. No, we will all stand in heaven and say, I don't deserve to be here. But by the grace of God, because I believed in Jesus, I trusted in him, I am here. And that's the greatest news, is that you can have that assurance of eternal life. Would you please bow as we close in prayer? Heads bowed and eyes closed. Do you remember a time that you've put your trust in Jesus, in him alone? You can do that today by saying something like this in silent prayer. Lord, I can't save myself, but I today put my trust, my dependence in Jesus and him alone. Thank you for giving me everlasting life. Thank you for saving me. And if you've done that today, can I pray for you? Can I rejoice with you? Just hold your hand up right now. Raise it for a second. You won't be embarrassed. I would love to rejoice with you if you've made that decision today. Hold your hand up for a moment. Let me pray for you, please. Is there someone today receiving by faith Jesus Christ? I see you. Are there any others today? This is between you and the Lord, but I'd love to rejoice with you and pray for you in your, your incredible step of faith that you're making. Is there someone else today? I might have missed someone. How thankful we are, dear Lord, for the incredible predictions that are in the word Lord, but the more important thing is, what will we do with Jesus? I thank you for the one today that has made that decision, and maybe more. Maybe others that aren't in the room, but they've made the same choice 
to not put their trust in themselves or their religion, but to put their trust in Jesus, the Son of God who died on the cross and rose again, who is God in the flesh, who will be coming back, who will never die, and those that have put their trust in him one time will never die. And Lord, how thankful we are for the fact that we will be forever with Jesus. Father, help us to serve him, love him, know him more and more, and tell others about him until he returns. In the name of Jesus, we pray these things. And all God's people said,